welcome welcome facebook live you guys can all wave and say hi <laughs> and welcome everyone at beautiful brigadoons they've actually recently remodeled it looks fabulous and have some delicious dinners later it'll be a really good time first off we do want to give a huge shout out to care of trance for sponsoring us to make facebook live possible so people all around the world can be able to attend well attend tonight's presentation and listen Next, we want to thank the Cottage Club for hosting our tonight's presentations expert. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you, Brigadoons, for hosting us tonight. And a huge thank you to all of our sponsors. Without them, this wouldn't be possible. So thank you to them. And just so you guys know, we've got a raffle going on. We'll be drawing it at the end of the month. These are some of the amazing raffle prizes that you guys can win. A two-for-one certificate on a liveaboard of Caribbean Explorer 2. You got glass art, three prizes from Aquamania that includes sailing around an island. Sounds really cool for two. Two nights stay at Travel Inn, a handcrafted knife by John. Pretty amazing. Wine gift basket from Ches Buba. And uh, two round-trip tickets on the Dawn to Seba Ferry. So really cool stuff, and let's not forget the two-night stay at Queen's Gardens. So yeah, some really good stuff, guys. If you guys are interested in entering into our raffle, we've got raffle tickets right by the entrance and exit. <laughs> yep, only $2 each for all of these good stuff. So it's totally good, good raffle prizes. Tonight, we have Anna Mites, and just so that you guys know, tomorrow is her public uh, field activity. So we're going to go diving and we're going to collect seagrass. If you guys come, we've also got a free little thank you thing, sustainable cutlery. So it helps us cut down on plastic and trash on Seva. So beautiful stuff. And now we'll get to why you guys are here tonight. Introduction for tonight's presenter. Give me just a second. All right, a little bit of background on Miss Anna Mites. She was born and raised in Sweden, where she also completed her master's degree in ethology at Ling oh, Linkshopping University. <laughs> in 2010, Anna traveled to the island of Stasia for an internship with Stasia's National Parks Foundation, which is basically like Seba's Conservation Foundation here on this island. In 2018, she joined the Caribbean Netherlands Science Institute, CNSI, as a marine e ecology researcher and the education outreach officer. She is currently a marine biologist at CNSI. Tonight, she will be presenting on the effects of the invasive seagrass species, Halophilia stipulacea, in the Caribbean. Please give a warm welcome to Anna Mites. Thank you. I just want to put this in this pocket, this fella. Okay, there. There you go. Okay. Hi. So I will pronounce Halophila stipulacea instead. <laughs> and also, I will say this so many times, and I will mainly just refer to it as stipulacea because it doesn't have a normal common name. So, oh, so I got an introduction. Um, so today I'm going to try to answer what are the effects of the invasive seagrass species Halophila stipulacea in the Caribbean. So this is what I'm going to talk about. This is the outlines. I'm going to do a general small introduction about St. Eustatius, if there's anybody here that doesn't know about the island. And then I'm going to talk about seagrass species in the Caribbean, and obviously uh, Halophila stipulacea as well. And then I'm going to talk about my two different research topics. One of them is what I call, for now, the regrowth experiment. And then I have one called primary production. And then a little summary on all of it. So let's start. This is Stacia, or we say Stacia, St. Eustatius. Um, just like Seba, it's a special municipality within the Netherlands. It is 21 square kilometers, so it's huge. <laughs> and we have 3,000 inhabitants, more or less. So yes, so this is the lower bay, yeah, the island from above and below. Uh, we have a marine park, just as Seba has, and it's all around the island as well. 
Uh, the marine park is from the shoreline to the 30 meter depth contour. I know here is to the 60 meter depth mm. contour, but you also have drastic slopes down. Um, mm. And we have two marine reserves. One is in the s uh, southern part, where no fishing and no anchoring is allowed. And we have one in the northern part. And there as well, there's no fishing and anchoring. And we have a very small artisanal fishery on the island as well. So it's not a big pressure from fishermen there. So I work for the Caribbean Netherlands Science Institute, CNSI, that is part of NEOS, Royal Netherlands Institute for Sea Research in Holland. And Royal NEOS is an institute of NBO, the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research. And this is our facilities. This is where the main office is. And on top, if we have interns or students, they live here or visiting researchers. And in the middle, it's down by the fisheries where we have the mesocosm so we can pump up seawater in. And you can see how it's set up to the left or to your right. Um, so they do their research there. So what about the seagrass? So general information about seagrass, they are a marine flowering plant, so they have roots that are in the sediment, so it's not an algae. Um, there are 60 species in the world, and they, seagrass beds are very diverse and productive ecosystem because it inhabits a lot of different uh, animals, from fishes to mollusks to isopods to crustaceans. And they are also really good because they they have deep root system with rhizomes roots, so they hold down the sediment to trap it down in place. And that also, in turn, reduces the wave action. So they are also referred to as an um, ecosystem engineers because it prevents or is a part of prevention of erosion as well as the presence of the, um, the seagrass uh, also alters um, the quality. It sucks up the heavy metals and takes it down to the sediment, and that becomes a healthier environment, and it also benefits coral systems that are around by trapping in the sediments and the heavy metals. So, seagrass can be found on all continents except Antarctica. It's too cold. But seagrass can also be found in colder regions as well as in warm. They usually prefer to live or grow in more shallow, sheltered areas or uh, with less wave action, but we're not going to focus about like all the seagrass in the world, just the Caribbean area. So we have se seven recognized native species in the Caribbean, and these are all the uh, Latin names, and I will do my uh, interpretation of how to pronounce them. <laughs> so they are Tilasia testodium, Serum godium filiform, Hadula rite, Rupia maritime, Halophila baloni, Halophila engelmani and Halophila dispensis. So these are three different kinds that we have here. So on Stasia, recently, that means within the 10 year span, we have recorded three of the seven seagrass species. So for instance, we have this one, Thalassia testodium. It's also referred to as turtle grass because turtles likes to eat it. And the bla blades are flat, they are quite long. They can grow up to 35 centimeters, and they're a centimeter wide. They're the most abundant seagrass in the Caribbean, and it's distributed over the entire Caribbean. And it grows in a more shallow habitat between zero and 10 meters. And then we also have the Sermgodium filiform, the on top to the right. And it's referred to as manatee grass, because manatees likes to eat this kind of grass. These blades are cylindrical. If yeah, uh, they are quite, if there's a storm, you can always see a couple of them coming up on shore. They can grow up to 50 centimeters, but that's quite tall. And uh, they are very common. Uh, I'm sorry, and the width is only a millimeter, so they're very slim and skinny. Uh, the distribution is throughout the Caribbean, and it grows, can grow a bit deeper from zero to 20 meter. Then we have the Hardula uh That's actually coming back more now on the station. Um, where this one actually looks very much like a terrestrial grass. Blades are flat and quite coarse. They grow to 10 to 15 centimeter long, 2 to 3 millimeter wide. It's fairly common and it is di distributed over the Caribbean. 
and it grows into more shallow from zero to 12 meters. So why is seagrass important in the Caribbean? It's just like grass. <laughs> and if you look at it, you see sediment, you see grass, and that's it. It's not so exciting as a coral reef. But of course it's important because it inhabits a lot of different species. So either it is for shelter and protection or nurseries or hunting grounds. So these little crabs, they're here to hunt whatever they can find. These little snails are trying to protect themselves. Uh, and then we have anemones, starfish. So there's a lot of different phyla that lives, could potentially live within the seagrass. But as you may know, uh, here on stage and Seba, we think that the queen conch is quite important. Uh, and you have a lot of it. And apparently you mainly fish it on Seba Bank, and we also fish it. So it has a commercial value since we like to eat it. And conchs, they have their nursery within the native seagrass. So in 2002, a new invasive seagrass species was discovered within the Caribbean, and that was Haloflastiplacea. So it, it orig originates from the Red Sea by Israel and Egypt, uh, and then in Indian Ocean. So they are shorter in the leaves, three to six, six centimeters, and they're three to eight millimeters wide. You can really recognize them because they have very, they're very veiny, and you can see the grooves um, very well on the seagrass. They are common, and the distribution is from the uh, eastern and southern Caribbean for now. And the typical depth is all the way from zero to 30. Can they be wider than their long? Yeah. Uh, no, wider than long? Yeah, because they can only be six centimeters long and eight centimeters wide? Oh, mill millimeters. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. God. Otherwise, they're little fatties. <laughs> no problem, no problems. OK. So as I said, in 2002, it was reported in Grenada. But all of these islands that are marked with black, it's not the greatest image are where they have reported stipulacea. So it's all the way down in Aruba, Curaçao, and Bonaire, and I also know it's in Venezuela. And in Stacia, we had it, and uh, we reported in 2013, and I know also now from publications, and this is old, that it's already in Puerto Rico. So it's a matter of time until it goes up to the Florida Keys, and they are trying to prepare. So, what do we know about the effects of Halopila stipulacea <laughs> in the Caribbean? That's my son. <laughs> in the Caribbean. So what I do, I do two different or two different topics. Uh, I have the regrowth experiment and the primary production one. I will start talking a bit more about the regrowth experiment. That is, I'm trying to figure out how does this seagrass behave in a new environment, like even the general biology of it. We know much more about the seagrass in its native habitat of the Red Sea, but not so much how it works here. We know it's like really proliferate here, but that's it. So we're trying to figure out the growth and mortality and spread in general bi biology. And then I have a primary oh. production where we measure the dissolved oxygen of the seagrass, the sediment, and the water column. I will go into depth with that later. So the regrowth experiment is most likely the seagrass is spread so widely because of pleasure yachts. And if you see in the background of the image, this is a fragment of the Stipulacea. And one of these guys, if it's like this, it, and it's ripped out, it can free flow for weeks in the water and then resettle somewhere and continue growing. So the spread is great. So it was first documented in Grenada, and because of we have quite some uh, yachts traveling in the Caribbean, they think that's how it was spread. It grows in monospecific strands, meaning it grows a lot by itself. It doesn't mix with other seagrasses. Other seagrasses can be living together, but this one prefers to be alone. It can happen, of course, that you see some. Um, and it also outcompete native seagrasses. For instance, the manatee one, the really skinny one, we have seen that we can have a beds and then uh, stipulacea comes in and then after a while you don't see any so uh, manatee grass left 
so yes, I did say that it can live in the free for weeks and then resettle. So for my experiment, I have two different areas where I took my samples from. The red one is the general use area where we have the harbor and we have, we have an oil terminal on station. So a lot of the anchors are uh, moored around here. This is also where most of the hotels are. So an anthropogenic input. And then we have the, the southern reserve where we took the other uh, samples from. So what we did, we had pre-marked areas. So we would go to exactly the sp same spot at all the time. And at week zero, we cut our areas out and brought all of it back. And then we come back after two weeks of growth and recut it and see how long, how much and how long, no, not how long, how much had grown in two weeks. And we took that. And then after four weeks and six weeks and eight weeks and 100 days and 150 days in the two sites. So there was a lot of bags of seagrass. So this is how it looks. Um, this is the pre-marked area. If you see the rebar here that is totally encrusted, and I'm very, this one had this lint, but usually it doesn't. So you have to find this piece. <laughs> and uh, this one is not fully, there's still some leaves left. So when we are done, nothing is left in this square. And we always put the left corner by the rebar. And then I secure it with a knife after I cut so it doesn't shift around because it's very easy that it shifts around and then you start collecting a bigger area. And then after two weeks, we come back again. So we know how long it takes. So and then I take all my bags back to the office and the lab and start to analyze them. So what I do is a lot of counting. So we look how, sorry how many shoots, and a shoot is two leaves. So this is a shoot, so I cut them all off and I count them. And this is an apical here, you can, you, maybe it's hard to see. Here is a new shoot that came from the apical, and this apical has like little baby leaves inside of it. So this is the growth where, where the seagrass grows from. Uh, and then we have the roots that are considered shallow for seagrass in the Caribbean, and then the rhizome. And when I separate all of it, so we have above ground biomass and below ground biomass. This is what I have here. We put it in the oven for 24 hours, and then we measure the dry weight to be able to calculate biomass. And then we also do a lot of photoanalysis to, to look at the growth and mortality. Oh, sorry, and the scars. These are the scars. So we also take this into account because this means that a leaf has died and uh, fell off, but it doesn't mean like the entire plant is dead. And here you can see one leaf is gone. So we take all of that into account. Uh, also a number of branches, I will show you an image of that. And then I also calculate the leaf area on all of this to later on be able to do more analysis. So. This one is a more complicated fragment. So now you have to know which one is the mother fragment and which ones are the side shoots. So this one is the mother fragment. So these ones are the side shoots. So then uh, we, we document that and use it for later. And then you have to count all the shoots and apicals because sometimes it can have several apicals. And of course, that means it grows even quicker and further. So what I came up to is, I will probably stay here. Um, no. So this one, filiforme, that is the manatee grass. So this is the image for this one. And testodium is the turtle grass. And stipulacea is this one. So what we did is we tried to figure out per square meter how many leaf shoots we had. So this is based from another paper from Williams, uh, 87. And they found that. Um, the filiforma had between 1,000 to 2,000 shoots per square meter. Testodium had between 1,600 plus minus 500. And we have 7,700 shoots per square meter. That's quite a lot, and it's very dense. And then if we look at the, the biomass, this biomass is, is not so high. It's just 34 grams, but then they're very skinny and tall. These ones are quite chunky. So they are 207, uh, because yeah, they are quite big and heavy when you pick them up, and this is less. 
So we also came to, the, for now, the conclusion that it takes like four days for one shoot to develop and seven days for one to die. So it goes quicker to develop shoots than for it to die. And this is important because we're doing a model and trying to do a mo modeling locally to actually see how the seagrass bed is growing and how m if you have two two sided fragments or if you have four to see the actual expansion of it. And sadly, we're not done with it. I wanted it to be done before here, but this has to be to uh, continued later on. So what we do know, at least, is that <coughs> Stipulacea creates very dense, continuous mats with little or no sediment exposed. As you can see here, you see a little bit of sediment, but not much. And it outcompetes native seagrass. Uh, and we only currently observe just a few strands of the native, if any, when we go and look at it. So a paper that was, <coughs> sorry, that was, uh, now I totally lost the word, published in May 2019 um, from Eric Bowman uh, et al. Uh, and I was a part of this one. We did one that was called Diet and Growth of Juvenile Queen Conch. Lobotus gigas in native, mixed, and invasive seagrass habitat. And this research was twofolded. So we investigated the diet from juvenile conchs, as well as, uh, yeah, so I will start with this. We uh, examined the diet. So we took um, biopsies from the, the, the juvenile conch, and we used stable isotope analysis. So uh, we took samples from uh, conch that only lived in native seagrass, and those were located in sink parts. And we took samples from conch that lived in mixed seagrass, meaning mixed native seagrass with the invasive halophila, and that was in St. Martin. And we took samples from St. Justatius, where it's only s uh, invasive seagrass. So we took those samples for analysis. And then the other part of the the research was <coughs> we did uh, a growth experiment when we had underwater cages for and we caged in juvenile conchs. So three of the cages were put in native seagrass and three of them were put in uh, invasive seagrass. So to really, really fast forward this paper to just the results is that we found that, okay, sorry, I need to hold back. Before this paper, it was believed that uh, conch ate detritus, so um, dead com decomposed leaves of the seagrass and the seagrass. But this paper proved that it's actually that they don't eat the leaves; they eat the sediment where the benthic diatoms are in, and they eat particular organic matter uh, that is the most important food source because they are located in the nurseries. And the growth experiment showed that conch uh, also showed the ones that were in the invasive seagrass were reduced compared to the, uh, the seagrass that were in the native uh, seagrass beds. So to explain what diatoms are, they're a major group of algae. And diatoms are a type of plankton, and they're the most common plankton. And they are dependent, they're from pho photosynthetic, so they are dependent on sunlight. So we have different kinds of diatoms. You have diatoms that are benthic, living on the bottom or the, the s a surface, and there's also free flowing uh, diatoms as well. And they are very important because they generate approximately 20% of the oxygen on the planet each year. And they are important food source for several different species uh, in the sea. So we suggested that the reduced growth of these juvenile conchs in the enclosures is due to the high density growth of the Stipulacea. It could be either that the light, because there was so little sediment, that the light outcompetes the diatoms, or that the conch had a very hard time being able to graze the sediment because there's too much seagrass in the way and they're like flat and trying to suck up the sand and maybe the seagrass is in the way? Or is it that the seagrass itself for being present are doing some kind of alteration in the sediment with pH? Lots of question. So 
so much more research has uh, to confirm this. But that made me, us CNSI, think of does Halophilus cephalosea affect the abundance of diatoms and how in that case? So then I started my primary production um, investigation. So we are com doing comparative analysis of benthic diatom production in native and invasive seagrass of different densities. But not all only are we doing, we are doing native, and I went to Israel over there because it's native in Israel, so I run the same ex uh, experiment there. And uh, we went to Crete, where it has been invasive in the Mediterranean for plus 130 years when they opened the Suez Canal. Uh, but here I wouldn't say it's invasive, I would say it's alien, because it doesn't seem to have such an effect on their, their ecosystem. And then on Stasia, where it's definitely invasive. So again, I'm showing you the same photos, but from a different aspect now. So I want you to notice that, yeah, there are different structures. This is tall and slim, a lot of sand. This one is tall and a bit chubby, quite some sand. This one is short and chubby, no sand. So to make a little analogy, thank you. It's just like the coconut trees, if you want shade. There's not so much shade, but the diatoms, they don't want shade. They want to have the sun. So they have a lot of space to be around here if you're on a turtle grass. But here we have the lovely sea grape that is great if you want shade, but if you're a diatom, you don't want this. You just have a couple of spots where you potentially could have sun for your own living. So what we did, we measured dissolved oxygen. So that is, we're trying to measure all the oxygen that is being produced by the organism. So the seagrass, the diatoms that are in the sand and in the water column. Um, yeah. So this is our setup. Um, it's a bit cut off, but anyway. So we put in a uh, PVC core. So we have a known area of how much we're gonna measure the seagrass. And then we put this see-through cylinder so all the sunlight can come in. And this is an enclosed system. So there is this water that is in there, I know how much water is in. And no fresh or other water can come in because I only want to measure what's in here. This one is <laughs> a homemade pump that we created that has to circulate the water because if it's not circulated, the oxygen, um, production can be very um, layered. It's not evenly distributed throughout. This one is a DOT, a dissolved oxygen temperature logger that does my measurements. So we have three of these in seagrass and three of them in just bare sediment. But we have different treatments too. So if we want to calculate production, we have to know respiration, so that means what the plant does in the dark. So when we go down, we take all of it down, and we actually put blackout curtains over them and weigh them down, and then we run the experiment for an hour. We go down again and we reset it. So we change the water, but we have the same core. Then we do a light incubation, same again, but in the light, representing daytime, time to produce oxygen. And then the third treatment is that we are using black aquarium sand to block out the diatoms. Then we just want to measure how much does the seagrass produce and how much does the water column produce. Then we ha have all different uh, factors separated so later on we can calculate what produced what. And these incubations are made at a depth of 18 meters in all three of locations so we can have the comparison analysis later. So this is how it looks. Uh, we have a PAR reader here that, that measures the, the light that comes in. Uh, so here, this one looks like it's the, the treatment day with black sand. And these ones are just in the sediment. And now we're actually just wa uh, measuring the water column, so the, the free-flowing diatoms. Some preliminary result from Stasia, I need to say, I should have been 
much further away with this one, but I got quite sick, so I wasn't allowed to die for months. So my data collection is not where I wanted it to be. So I just show you primary results. So here, the blue line, it represents seagrass in the daytime. So it's the light incubation. incubation. So it's confined, and we can see the longer the time goes, more and more oxygen is being produced by the bottom and the seagrass and the water. Then we have the orange line. This is in the dark, nighttime. So you can see that oxygen production stops and it actually goes down. And then the gray one is when we black out the, the sand. So there is no production at all, but then a little bit because this one has the few strands of seagrass coming up from it. So it's actually just the seagrass itself that is producing the last bit, but not the diatoms. And here, the primary preliminary sorry, results from Crete and, uh, and ALAT. Uh, we could see that here on this axis we have the dissolved oxygen in milligram per liters. And at the bottom we have dry weight of leaves. So the less biomass of halophila, the higher oxygen consumption, uh, production, sorry, not consumption. So, it shows the less biomass, the more, more diatoms producing oxygen. So if this is true, then this would confirm that my hypothesis, but I, of course, I need to do more, more analysis of my, my data, but then this is a good indication that we are in the right way of confirming our hypothesis. So, but I would also like to run several experiments in different native Caribbean seagrasses as well, at the different depths and different densities to confirm this hypothesis that it's also density dependent, and also in mixed, like native and invasive seagrass beds. So some primary conclusion about primary production, uh, that if uh, Stipulacea has a high density, n there is a negative impact on the diatome oxygen production. And referring back to the conchs, conchs are commonly not found in high density native seagrasses, but also it's not very common that we have high density native seagrasses. So in turn, it could mean that potentially for conchs, this could be tricky. But I have to say to be continued with the primary production again. This is a beautiful diatom. Um, and I will come back with more of a result to see if my hypothesis was correct or not. So a general summary about all of it uh, is that uh, we do see indication that limitation of light affects benthic diatoms. And we are figuring out the general biology of uh, Stipulaceae in the Caribbean. Caribbean and it is very similar of how it is growing in its native range in Israel. Uh, we are analyzing and mo for the modeling of how the mm. Stipulacea is growing locally. And uh, we need to continue to collect data for primary production to confirm the hypothesis and in different seagrasses and densities and keep on researching about the effects of Palophila Stipulacea. And thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Um, a couple questions. Uh, is it is it found on Seba and what is it consumed by the, uh, any of the turtle species? Okay. Did you guys hear it in the back? Yeah. Yeah. So here, yeah, uh, is it found on Seba and is it consumed by turtles? Yes, it is found on Seba. Um, today, I had Mike. He brought me a sample when I went to school, and you found them by the moorings of the boats. And there was one lady from the senior group today that said there is a lot down by the airport. I don't know. I don't know. Um, yes, and there also been studies that sea turtles do graze on it. And more and more now, in the beginning, they quite rejected it. And there's been studies of seeing if they prefer native or not. They prefer native. But if still now, we don't know the, the nutritional value of it. Mm. If, 
if they can retain it. And there's been quite other studies. We're looking at our fish, how they prefer. And they seem to be, they have like some kind of phenol, 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 how do you pronounce that? Phenol, phenol, um, that is harsh tasting. So they don't prefer to eat it. But maybe they learn because the turtles are starting to consume it more and more. Yes? Okay, so this is a bit of a complicated question. Okay. <laughs> so um, you're saying that you first noticed um, the this, this seagrass in 2002 in the Caribbean. Yeah. And presumably you're saying that they came through um, like the super yachts, the luxury yacht, yachts. And presumably they're coming through the Panama Canal, right? Because otherwise, if they went through the southern tip of South America, it might be too cold for them to survive, right? No, because in the Mediterranean, they also live. So I, I think they came from, because they've been in the Mediterranean for 130 plus years. So I actually think it's more the Mediterranean, Caribbean. But then also, genetically, they're quite also a different matter. Uh, but I I don't so think... So don't think they came through the Panama Canal? No. They came from the Atlantic, okay. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if this is confirmed. I know they're trying to do genetic studies, but apparently that's not so easy with, uh, with sea grasses. Because I was wondering, if they came through the Panama Canal. The Panama Canal has been open for over 100 years, yeah. so why is it just 2002? Exactly, and why did it start further down? And it's not up there yeah. yet. So uh, that's why I do think it's coming from the other side, from the Mediterranean side instead. But this is just my hypothesis, so... <laughs> yes? That's also the thing. The so he's asking, so since seagrass it has a doom and gloom story, they, they're dying off everywhere, and now there is a seagrass, why is this so bad? And it potentially doesn't have to be so bad, but the problem is it is pushing away our native stuff that we have, and also it can affect a lot of the animals that live and, and use the, the seagrass beds as their nurture, for instance the conch. If it now is the case that and it is the case that they eat the, the benthic diatoms. With this, these guys, it covers, you barely see the sediment. So then the conks, if they don't move away, if they can, then they're fine. But yes, I actually heard some people say, it's like, yeah, but you should be happy because at least we have some seagrass. But these ones, though, I mentioned briefly before that they have quite shallow roots. So if there's a lot of wave action, this is just uprooted and it disappeared. So for us, in the general use area, after Irma and Maria, all of it was gone. So we ha had bare sediment, and some of the native the manatee grass were still there. But in two years, it's this is after two years. So uh, now it's beautiful again. So it came back. Yeah. And also, when it's uprooted and shipped, yes. So all these fragments, potentially, if they have a chance to settle down, if it doesn't go too far out, and I'm also wondering about this, they say it can go to 30 meters. That's because you, recreational diving is to 30 meters. Um, so let's see if, if it can. And it really loves the Caribbean. As we have plenty of sunlight. Uh, temperature is great. And I think my personal opinion, I think also we, for why we have more in one location and station than the other is also because there's a lot of nutrients coming in. So I think it's very nutrient dependent. But it's not all doom and gloom. Apparently, if it grows in black sand, it's more proliferate and dense than it does in white sand. So it seems to be some like some kind of component in the sand as well that determines how it grows. Yes? Yeah, without uh, playing too much with like manipulating ecosystems, for some of the areas um, I noticed on your map where seagrass does not grow at all, like the southern eastern portion of the United States and Carolinas, it seems to be absent, right? Yeah. So is it possible? With this one? This one is, would it be well I wouldn't say this one is the greatest because it, it really uproots quickly. And yeah. I, I don't know how it looks now after we just had Karen passing. And I also said that to Mike, maybe because he said he didn't see that much. Yeah. But you guys, I saw the images how the water just went down the bay and the waves you had that maybe potentially could have uh, uprooted. And then also, it's never, I don't think it's ever a good idea to replant 
uninvasive anywhere. But it most likely could live all the way up to North Carolina because they have, it can live and grow uh, up to 14, 14 degrees Celsius. Uh, they've done it in, in Spain, so it's continuing in Mediterranean. We're just looking at like a uh, generating more biomass, so we yeah. have just bare sand, there's not much production, but now you introduce yeah. plots of this, yeah. you know, get up to Yeah, you get more, yeah, for sure. Yeah. You said 14? Yeah, 14 degrees. Because for a while it stopped somewhere by Italy's coast, and they didn't, because I know very little about the sea of the Mediterranean, but there's some kind of basin of somehow and there's a temperature drop but now it has jumped it and continued over to Spain. Yes? So a similar question, you're studying its effect on conch, can we only, what do you know about the other life that likes this invasive uh, seagrass? So are there more little crabs or the nursery aspect or the anemones, you know, what about the nursery and protective uh, creatures, how are they doing in the secret? Yeah, and that is also something I would like to, to, uh, oh, oh, sorry. Um, yes, so if I know other animals that can benefit from the st uh, Stipulacea seagrass or not benefit, and I'm, I don't know enough about this, but I have noticed when I take my, my quarters that we do encounter a lot of small crustaceans and, and, shrimps but then I don't know about the other seagrasses enough either myself uh, to know if they I assume that they benefit otherwise they wouldn't be there yes the for sure yeah for, for the little ones they have an excellent hiding place in there and we have seen some um, uh, diadema in it just once or twice so we maybe this is a good thing but it's too early to say at least for me I, I cannot really answer that question. Yes. Nice talk. Thank you. Um, <laughs> first question is, you talked about juvenile conch. Yeah. The adults, will they eat this seagrass? Or are, are you claiming that the adult conch also eat benthic diatoms? The adult also eat benthic diatoms. This is the conch expert. He's my husband, yeah, so <laughs> 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 so he can answer that question since he's <laughs> he's uh, nodding. They do also eat algae, So the question was, oh, this one? Oh, then he can do it. Is it on? The question was what do adult conch eat? And basically, we don't have a lot of information. There is information out there which suggests that they eat uh, seagrass detritus, which my beautiful wife explained is, uh, well, semi or partially broken down leaves. But they mainly, well, we believe, we have to do more studies, but they do eat benthic diatoms it's been found a lot of sand in their stomach, which indicates that they do eat a lot of this. Uh, they also eat algae. Uh, cyanobacteria, some species likely, but most likely the benthic diatoms is very important for the adults as well. But for the juveniles, they also have to hide. So yeah. Because if you wanted to just eat benthic diatoms, you might as well live in the sand. Like exactly, but then they're exposed. Yeah. Yeah. Then also for the halophila, it's not that much cover for a juvenile conch because a juvenile conch is still this size and if the halophila can get some kind of protection but it's not the same protection if it would go in turtle grass or needle grass that is much higher and lusher. So of course they can live in the, the periphery and eat the sand there but then they are very exposed. Is so. there any evidence that just, that this particular seagrass is taking over territory that no other seagrass has ever yeah. taken over before. Yeah. So in that respect, they may actually be adding primary production that hadn't previously been present in the system. Yeah. So he's asking if uh, 
If this seagrass has been growing in areas where no seagrass has been grown before, and if that would have then increased uh, primary production and biomass a bit, what you said as well, and um, if you mean by no sea, like this area on Stasia, historically we've been told 10 plus years ago that used to have uh, the turtle grass, but there was one big hurricane that wiped it all out and then it was barren for years. And then this one came in and there were some serum golden here and there, but it was no, no meadow, it was more patchy. Uh, so yes, it actually added in that sense. Uh, so yeah, it also adds primary production and biomass. So it's a bit, yeah, for sure. Yes. Yeah, one more question. So I learned that, that uh, the seagrass learns of this cycle in the, in the sediment, where they uh, have this symbi symbiosis with the shells, where they uh, have these toxic uh, residues, the nitrogen and sulfur. No, oh, really? Uh, <laughs> and if without these shells, they cannot actually process these, these, these chemicals. Uh, where is this? Well, <laughs> I if mean, you're really, uh, if you're yeah. in, I can, I can ask for this. Uh, yeah, sure. Anyway. But uh, therefore, I was really curious if these seagrasses have also this kind of cycle back at the native like this. Yeah. They are now here that they don't have this, like, actually maybe be poisoning the this yeah, I mean, and, and this is stuff that I haven't done because seagrasses are known also to be like a carbon sink that they, they bind in and they, they oxygenate uh, the sediment. Um, but they don't know about this yet because also, again, I think that the, the, the native seagrasses have a very incredible and deep root system with a rhizome that really holds it together. And sometimes if you dig down like 20 meters core samples, you can still find the, the dead root systems and that's how it brings it in. These guys don't do the same, but this is also stuff that I know is in progress of being researched right now. So I can't really, yes. Is there natural habitat? Are in they in still basin. short roots? Where, where, where are they growing your lats? Uh, do yeah. they still have just a very short roots? Yeah, they do. But then also to dive in the Red Sea, is like diving in, in like in a lake, it's on a bowl. It's like plops, and then you're just there. It's like there's barely any wave action, so they're just left alone. Where because they are really in the the, the bay, uh, what is it called like Abak Abak? Yes, Akaba, a bay. With cultivating seagrasses, just in general, like uh, for areas that are lacking the turtle grass, is it even feasible to try to grow it like a farmer would grow corn? But, um, is that something to cultivate seagrasses and replant them in areas? They do. Is that successful at all or um, not so much? In Sweden, actually, they have fairly successful, but they also have a difference because of seasonality and all that stuff. Uh, in the Caribbean, I know also in Holland they do s regrowth, but you didn't sound so positive about that that information. So in the Caribbean, I don't know if they do. I know they try in the, f in the Floridas, but I actually don't know the results of that. Sorry, I forgot. You take it from Germany. I forgot to repeat this question. So, yeah. Any more questions? Yes? How big a fragment of the plant do you have to have for it to propagate? Like, can you just have a piece of the leaf, or do you have to have some of the roots? So the question was, how big of a fragment does does the halothal have to be? Can it just be a piece of a root or a leaf? So the fragment has to be, uh, it has to have the apical. Let's see if I can find one. Um, it doesn't have to be big at all, but it has to have, bear with me. Oh, there. Okay, this one is even better. So if it's just a leaf, nothing is going to happen. That one is going to die. But if this part, like here, because this one has a root and this is the apical, this is going to grow well. But if you, this is chopped off and this part and these roots will settle or another root comes out, this one can continue living too because it will just create an apical and continue growing. It can get side shoots just like, just like this one so if you chop this one off this push okay this doesn't look so nice at the moment because it's been out of the water this can continue living with no problem and um, there is they say there is one place in the Caribbean that it has been flowering that's the first documentation that was last year so these reproduce vegetatively yes um, 
So the question was, sorry, if it has been any flowering observ uh, observed here. When I was in I Israel, I was fortunate to see them flowering, and it was really nice. But it's very unusual here. I do think that has a bit of that it's so new here that it uh, hasn't had enough time to to start flowering. Uh, not not yet, not not on Stasia, but they did find it in one place in the Caribbean that it did. Ah, uh, yeah, separate. separate. Yes, separate. sorry. They if they they have a separate male flower, a uh, separate male. Um, strand and a female strand. Yes. Yes? Um, how do these grasses uh, attach themselves to the yachts coming from the Mediterranean across the Atlantic? In the... In the... Um, in the, the, the e, e, yeah. Get stuck inside. Could. If it goes all the way from there, for sure it's probably in the bilge uh, or in the, in the ballast bilge water. If it's amongst in the Caribbean, it could be like from fish traps that it's stuck and then you move away to the next island like we have it here or in the anchor chain or anything. And then if it's just uprooted, they've done tests when they just throw it down on seagrass and count how many fragments that come up and then the current takes it. You're welcome. Interesting presentation. Give her another round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. In just a moment, we will give you, there we go, <laughs> have a list of our upcoming events for the next few days. Tomorrow, you can join Anna and her husband for a dive uh, to collect seagrass and analyze it as well. Then on Wednesday, Eric gives his presentation at Long Hall on conch, <laughs> yes. Then on Thursday is his field project where you can do a conch survey dive with him. And then Friday, finally on Thursday, we have our tropic bird expert who is also here in the back. Yep, there's Hannah. You can come hike, see some tropic bird nesting sites, hopefully. And then we'd like to thank you all so much for coming to this event. Thank you, Brigadoon, for hosting us. Round of applause. <laughs> like to thank our Facebook audience. Thank you so much for joining us. Wave again. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs> and then as you guys are making your way out from the presentation, please, we ask that you go to the bar. We have to set up this area for tables and for dinner. So as soon as you're able, make your way out. That would be great. Um, and yeah, we'd like to thank all of our sponsors once again, particularly Carib Trans. <laughs> all right, have a fabulous night. <laughs> Miami is known as an international community and the hub of trade and logistics for the Caribbean and Americas. A leader in the freight logistics industry, Carib Trans has served the Caribbean region for more than 30 years, with a footprint that has grown from one island to now serving the majority, as well as Central and South America. Carib Trans is an NVOCC, a non-vessel operating common carrier meaning it has the same responsibilities as a shipper without owning the vessels or planes. Its primary customers, individuals who ship clothing, electronics and other personal items, and occasionally cars. Most of the stuff that they're sending is because they, they don't get it there. So for us to provide it on two services, air and ocean, we can give it a choice of how fast you want it. So if you want it really fast, we're going to send it by air, you're going to have it next day, sometimes even the same day. That on-time service has been the key to Carib Trans' success, whether shipping by air or by sea. The company moves about 5,000 TEUs of freight each year, more than any NVOCC in the region. And since it joined the Salchuk family of transportation companies a couple of years ago, Carib Trans can offer customers even more shipping options. Other NVOCCs, they depend on other uh, shipping lines 
that are not part of their family. So they need to rely on whether they're going to sell or not, whether they are late or not. It doesn't happen to us because it's part of our family of, uh, of companies. We, we control the service that we give. Sí, buenos días, por favor, con Diana. Quality service is what keeps customers coming back. Customers are treated like family, and when they leave to research competitors, it doesn't usually last long. They have left and they have come back because they said that, you know, nobody does it better <laughs> than current trends. So because of that relationship. That exceptional service includes consolidation. Customers can have freight sent here and store for free for up to a month then consolidated and shipped on to the islands and Americas. A perk for the region's growing small business market. Puerto Rico is an expanding market for carib trends, about the size of Connecticut and rich in history and culture. Puerto Rico is home to many pharmaceutical manufacturers, as well as a thriving tourism industry for which Carib Trans moves raw materials and supplies. But serving small businesses is still the company's bread and butter here in San Juan. Businesses like Aldera Cafe, a local coffee company, owner Alfredo Rodriguez started growing coffee beans at his mountain farm about 20 years ago. He recently ordered a variety of new equipment for his farm and shop. He uses Carib Trans because it consolidates shipments, which cuts down on the number of times he has to pay the Puerto Rico import tax. Not many companies want to do that. They want only big cargos and uh, maybe half container or full containers, but they don't, they don't want to consolidate because it's, uh, it's more difficult. Turning challenges into opportunities is what Carib Trans does, and that includes helping to grow small businesses like Caldera Cafe by taking the hassle out of shipping. We uh, can be a gateway to expand their, their business in the Caribbean and, and back to the U.S. And wherever they can, they can sell their products, we are also going to be a partner for them. That customer dedication has made Carib Trans what it is today. Now as part of a larger family with more transportation resources, Carib Trans hopes to grow beyond its current market offering services to additional Latin American ports and eventually Europe and Asia. But even when it becomes a global logistics company, Carib Trans wants to stay true to its roots, always providing personalized, reliable customer service and a commitment to the communities it serves. <laughs>